morning. Welcome to this online service of worship from the Sanctuary at Friends Congregational Church. We are so glad that you have joined us today for this worship experience. We're an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, and no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We want to encourage you to participate fully in today's service. Download the worship guide for the service, which is found in the Facebook or YouTube post or on our website. Follow along with the readings, songs, prayers, and communion a little later in the service. Let us know you're here. Share your prayers in the comments section. Share the peace of Christ with one another. If you're visiting with us today, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We have an online visitor card that you can fill out and let us know that you are here. Help us to get to know you a little better and answer any questions you might have about our congregation. On this third Sunday in Lent, as we continue our journey in exile and our journey toward the cross, may we know today that Christ is journeying with us and is with us wherever we are. You are welcome. Welcome to worship. We stand in the need of the presence of God. Our lives can so easily become corrupted by our own greed. But the Lord has heard our cries and calls us forward on this journey. Holy One, guide our steps. Come, let us worship God who is always with us. Let us open our hearts to healing, restoring love of God. Amen. Oh, 
Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, we come to you this day with so many things laying claim to our lives, our hearts, and our spirits. Open our ears and our hearts to hear your word of healing love. Prepare us to be faithful disciples for you and loving servants for one another. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At, At this time, we want to invite our children to get close to their screens at home for a children's message. today. Throughout this month, we have been talking about a special collection that we're taking called One Great Hour of Sharing. And this is a collection that we take up with all the other churches in our denomination, in our United Church of Christ. And it's a chance for us to share the blessings that we have with people around the world who might not have what they need. We might not have enough water to drink or enough food to eat or a safe place to live. And this reminded me of one of my favorite stories. It's a book called The Harmony Tree. And I wanted to share this with you today. This story is really about how we are all connected and we have a chance to share with each other the blessings that God has given us. So let's tell the story together. Not long ago, there lived a vast grove of ancient trees. The tops of their crowns reached so high that they tickled the clouds. Their branches stretched so wide that you had to spin around to see them all. The tips of their roots furrowed so deep that they touched the purest streams of underground water. Life in the great forest was happy. The ancient trees protected the younger ones from growing too fast and provided plenty of food and shelter for many creatures. Everyone, from the ruffed grouse and black bear, to the white-tailed deer and milk snake, lived in balance and harmony. But one day, without warning, everything changed. The trees heard a frightful, terrible noise. It was a noise unlike any that they had heard before. It was loud. It was rough. It buzzed like a thousand wounded bumblebees. And then the noise did the unimaginable. One after the other, trees fell to the ground. First, it was the smaller ones. Their cries echoed throughout the forest. But the ancient trees could not stop the horrible sound. Soon after, the old trees were cut down, too. The ancient ones fell and fell and fell, until there was only one tree left standing. She was an ancient grandmother oak, and she did not know why she had been spared. Grandmother Oak waited for the terrible sound to come again. Day after day, she wondered when she would fall. Years went by, and Grandmother Oak's only comfort was remembering the years she shared with her friends and relatives in the ancient forest. Many long years passed before Grandmother Oak saw another tree. Then one day, square houses started appearing, each surrounded by a fence. And strangely, to her surprise, trees suddenly appeared in front of each house. There was something odd and unfamiliar about the new trees. They were certainly vibrant and beautiful, but they looked different. Even though the new trees were so unusual, Grandmother Oak was thrilled to be able to talk to another tree again. Welcome to your new home, she exclaimed. The new trees grew fast. It was astonishing how quickly they shot up, but it was too fast. When storms came, they couldn't bend with the winds, and their branches often broke. Sometimes the young trees blew completely over because their roots were so shallow. 
when clouds gathered and skies darkened, the new trees cried and wondered who would be the next to break. After years of silent watching, Grandmother Oak decided to speak. Friends, you need deeper roots to be strong. Deeper roots, asked one of the young trees. How do we get deeper roots? Grandmother Oak answered. Tell me the stories that connect you to this land. Eventually, a few of the trees became curious about the old oak tree. Grandmother Oak, do you know the stories of this land? Can you tell us what makes your roots so strong? Grandmother Oak smiled and began to speak about the ancient forest she knew so well. She started with the recent past and those days when her friends and family fell to the terrible noise. She then spoke of the happy days when her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren surrounded her, all the way back to twelve tree generations. She shared about the old trees that spent their mornings listening to the songbirds that landed on their branches. Flocks of passenger pigeons stopped on their migration and roosted for the night. Herds of woodland buffalo and elk took turns grazing on the grasses that grew between them. Grandmother Oak recalled how the ivory-billed woodpecker dug for insects on her branches. The young trees leaned in and listened and could almost feel their roots slowly reaching down to find new streams of water. They stretched a little taller as they heard tales of the ancient forests. Grandmother Oak's stories seemed as if they could go on forever, and they would have, without interruption. But something happened. All the trees heard the faint sound together. A soft thump had hit the ground. What was that? asked the young trees. Don't worry, friends, said a joy-filled grandmother oak. One of my acorns just dropped to the earth. They all smiled together as they thought about the seeds of new growth. Grandmother oak's branches stretched out, tickling the clouds. She could feel a gurgle of sap bubbling up inside her, reaching all the way from her strong roots to the tips of her twigs. Cool nights and her changing colorful leaves told her that autumn was on its way. A time to rest, stand tall, and hope for the future of the whole forest once again. When it comes, everything changes. Children can go to school. Women can start businesses to help support their families. Crops can grow. Neighbors can take care of each other. Markets can thrive. Families can be families. When water comes to a village, everything changes. Water is essential to life and the life of a village. We are giving makes projects like new wealth in villages possible. Give to one great hour of sharing and let love flow.
Let's be in a spirit of prayer together. At this time, you're invited to share out your prayers, joys, and your prayer concerns for this week, and we can be praying with you and for you through the church's email prayer chain. The prayers that we share in the comments of today's worship service, the comment section, go on that email prayer chain where we can be uplifting one another. At this time, let us pray together. Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we thank you for this day, for community gathered, where in spite of being separate from one another physically, we can gather in the tether of the Spirit. We come to you with so many prayers, prayers of joy and celebration for a beautiful weekend, for news of ongoing vaccinations of friends and loved ones and strangers, for the various ways that this community and so many communities throughout the country are caring for one another in the midst of uncertainty. And gracious Creator, we come to you with deep concern as well. At this point in our Lenten journey, where we're halfway there, we are wrestling with that feeling of uncertainty. The ambiguity of these days where we simply want to rest, O oh God. We pray for those who are struggling with health concerns, with difficult news, with a path forward and what that will look like for caregivers, and for their rest. We pray for systemic injustice to come to an end, O oh God, in all of its forms, and that in searching out ourselves in this time of Lent that we can recognize how we are connected to those injustices, that we would be a part of changing them, dismantling them for the sake of this whole world that you so love. And God, on this third Sunday in Lent in particular, when we turn to the scriptures that have been used so often against women, we pray for women and girls. We pray for empowerment, encouragement. And we pray that all of us, regardless of our gender and gender identity, that we would care for one another to see you, O oh God, your presence in each and every one of us, that we would uplift one another, affirming and celebrating who we are as you have made us to be, letting your dream be realized through that communal encouragement and empowerment. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ who gathers and strengthens us this day and always. Amen. Beloved community, the peace of Christ be with you all. Would you share peace with one another in the comments? Let us know that you're here. Share peace with those in your household and share that goodness with one another.
Here are a few of the things happening this week at Friends Church. Please join us on Tuesdays at noon for a time of learning, quiet, and prayer. In the weeks of Lent and beyond, we will be learning about the history and practice of centering or contemplative prayer. You can contact Jody Robinson with questions, and the Zoom link is found in today's worship guide. Continuing this Thursday at 6.30 p.m., Questioning Faith, the Renewing Process of Faith Reconstruction. Every Thursday during Lent, we will meet to provide a safe space to discuss the difficult process of deconstructing and reconstructing faith. Contact the church office for the Zoom link. All are welcome. Join us on Fridays at 3 p.m. with our neighbor, Peace Lutheran, as we work together to feed hungry folks from our community. You can contact Ann Worley for more information. Come to the Peace Lutheran parking lot where the distribution is happening. Wear your mask and prepare to make a tangible difference in the lives of those we are serving. The next outdoor worship service is tentatively scheduled for 9 a.m. on Sunday, March 21st. If our decision meter remains on orange or better and the weather permits, join us that morning with your lawn chair and face mask for our next in-person worship service. Moving forward, we hope to have outdoor services on the first and third Sundays of the month, including Easter Sunday, April 4th. Journey through Lent with the UCC Open and Affirming Coalition. Every weekday morning during Lent and Easter, the ONA family will continue to offer a contemplative service of Taze morning prayer at 9 and 11 a.m. Eastern Time in the Coalition's Zoom Chapel. You can also join them for Compline on Sunday evenings at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Each service of prayer is about 20 minutes and draws from ancient Christian practices of prayer. The Zoom link is found in today's worship guide. And please join us this week for our noonday time of prayer and check-in on Monday and Friday on Zoom, and for our time of prayer, communion, and scripture on Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. All are welcome. You can't hide love. It shows up where you least expect it, in places where food is scarce, in the rubble of a disaster's aftermath, where water is hard to come by, where home is a tent in a foreign land, in the middle of a pandemic. Love seeks us out. One great hour of sharing has sought to minister to people in need all over the world for more than 70 years. The work we have done behind the scenes responding to disasters, feeding the hungry, providing water to the thirsty, and empowering those who have been marginalized may not make headlines. But eventually, you just can't hide love. Join us in our pursuit to show God's love all over the world. Give to one great hour of sharing. Before we receive today's offering, we want to share with you some of what this faith community has given to us. Hi, my name is Cade Ponce, and I like coming to this church because I learn something new every single time. Hi, my name is Bryce Puente, and I love coming to this church because everybody ex is accepted. Hi, my name is Kat Fouch, and I love coming to French Church because everybody acts as they're a big family. Our tokens offered here are symbols of our lives of sacrifice lived every day. May we give ourselves to the world as a holy offering acceptable to God, our rock, and our redeemer. Information will appear on the screen for how to text your offering or give online.
Let us pray. Holy One, thank you for these gifts, for all who have given them, and for the opportunity to partner with you in co-creating your world and bringing your kingdom of love and justice and peace on earth as it is in heaven. Bless us now. May we know your spirit is guiding us in all things. We entrust all of this to you in the name of Jesus, our friend, our brother, and our Savior. Amen. A word about today's readings before we dive into the Word today. The first reading that we are going to hear comes from 1 Timothy 2, and it is a scripture that has been used throughout history against women. So I wanted to let that be known today before we hear this word, because we're going to call that out and do a little bit of truth-telling today, but that might not make it any easier for some of us to actually hear this scripture read. So as a bit of a trigger warning, if you will, I wanted to share that before we read the word and also invite us into a time of prayer where we can calm our spirit in preparation for hearing it and preaching on it. Would you pray with me? O loving and gracious God, send your Holy Spirit, we pray. Open the eyes of our hearts that we can hear anew your living word but also so that we can be protected from any harm and rise courageously to where you are leading us, following the trajectory of your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in your name. Amen. A reading from 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 15. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. 
But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. A reading from Psalm 57, verses 1 through 3. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the destroying storms pass by. I cry to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame those who trample on me. God will send forth his steadfast love and his faithfulness. The word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Jesus teaches us, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. For the last three months, we've been preaching on and learning from scriptures that are never read publicly, let alone examined, in the prescribed readings for the Christian calendar year. And these beyond the lectionary readings invite us to do some truth-telling. Today's reading from 1 Timothy has been used for generations to subjugate women, to keep them from leadership roles, and to maintain their subservience to men. Next week, we're looking at scripture that's been weaponized against our LGBTQ plus neighbors. These readings we're, we're given in this season of Lent invite us to tell those tough truths, to taste the freedom we receive in the resurrection of Christ at Easter. We've got to know the truth by telling it. And beloveds, let me suggest to us this morning that if we're going to tell the truth, we might have to question the Bible. That might make a lot of us uncomfortable, even if we know in our head that questioning certain verses in the Bible is a good and necessary exercise, a good and necessary act of faith. The church background instilled deeply in our heart might still be saying that's a no-no. Well, to address our head and heart, let's hold up the psalm we just read. Be merciful to me, O God. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the destroying storms pass by. I cry to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. God will send from heaven and save me. God will put to shame those who trample on me. God will send forth his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Beloved community, our soul takes refuge in God, not in the Bible. The Bible is where we find truth that guides us to the heart of God, that leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But it is in the shadow of God's wings that we take refuge. And it is in God most high who ultimately fulfills her purpose for us that we find that refuge, not in the divinely inspired, humanly selected pages of our holy writ. And in the Bible, time and again, God is questioned. Job, the most righteous man of God, questions how his state of utter misery could happen to someone as upright as him. Does God not see my ways and count my every step? The psalmist cries out to God in Psalm 13, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? Maybe some of us have been asking those questions of God over the last 12 months. And Jesus himself quotes the psalmist from the cross, crying out to God with a question. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Questioning God is exemplified across Scripture. So if we can ask God, even our most desperate frustrated questions, and God will not abandon us, never leave us forsaken, never stop loving us no matter what, then why would we be afraid to question the Bible for the sake of telling the truth? If telling the truth takes what is holy away from narratives of oppression and violence and returns what is holy to narratives of justice and liberation, why would we even hesitate 
to ask questions that need to be asked for the truth to be known. Jesus loved Scripture as we do. Jesus loved the Pentateuch, the Torah. He loved Scripture, and He loved it so much that He challenged it. I think of it as being similar to how James Baldwin loved America. James Baldwin said, I love America more than any other country in the world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Jesus loves Scripture so much that He calls it out to authenticate it. He challenges it to draw the deeper truth from it. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you will be acting as children of your Father in heaven. Today, it's through that faithful lens of questioning and challenging that we read this troubling text from 1 Timothy 2. And two women are going to help us do that this morning, Joanna Dewey and Jenna Daniels. Dr. Dewey is the Professor Emerita of Biblical Studies at Episcopal Divinity School at Cambridge. Now, 1 Timothy is written as a letter to Timothy from the Apostle Paul, but Dr. Dewey suggests that it's not really Paul who wrote the letter, but someone using his name to bring more authority to it when he writes, I permit no woman, dot, dot, dot. She also points out that the language in this reading sounds very much like an interpolation, which is something inserted after the fact to make an entirely different point. Basically, the command to women to be silent in church is not a command from Paul valid for all time, but the view of one author or one Christian group on how they would like to see women behave. And as far as 1 Timothy 2's notion that women need to get married and have kids to be saved, the rest of the New Testament is unanimous in making no distinction by gender. For men and women, according to 1 Peter 3, 7, are also heirs of the gracious gift of life. Plus, Paul pushes celibacy over marriage and motherhood for women anyway. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul writes, I'm telling those who are single and widows that it's good for them to stay single like me. Thanks, Paul. Now, the Reverend Jenna Daniels is the associate pastor at Awakened Community Covenant Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. Reverend Daniels doesn't question whether Paul wrote 1 Timothy, but she does point out some glaring contradictions and gives important context. Paul allegedly permits no woman to teach or have authority over a man, but in Romans 16, he sings the praises of a woman named Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sencrea. He says, Welcome her in the Lord in a way that is worthy of God's people, and give her whatever she needs from you, because she herself has been a sponsor of many people, myself included. And he goes on to tell the Christians at Rome about Priscilla and Aquila, his co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, he writes. Paul not only points out women in leadership, he celebrates them. But the context is even more fun. See, Timothy was in Ephesus. That's where he receives the letter we read from today. And one of the things Ephesus was known for was its devotion to the goddess Artemis. Artemis' temple was four times the size of the, of the Parthenon in Athens. People's incomes revolved around Artemis' worship. The goddess was a huge deal to the Ephesians. And Artemis was the goddess of fertility. It was thought that she had the power to give life and to take life. So it was common for women to call upon Artemis for help in labor when giving birth. What's unique about this cult, Daniels points out, is that it was entirely run by women. Where men did play a role, they were subservient. People would come to the temple and pay a high priestess for sex, which was thought to reenact spring when Artemis blesses the earth with new life. This kind of Gnosticism was likely going around in the church community at Ephesus. So when Paul says that he does not permit a woman to teach 
or assume authority over a man and that she'll be saved through childbearing, he's addressing a specific group of women who were false teachers in his estimation, influenced by the Artemis cult where women in leadership was the norm. And when Paul talks about women being saved through childbearing, he's addressing the mythological influences that dominated Ephesian culture. Context is everything. So Reverend Daniels doesn't see Paul telling all women they are not made to teach or lead, but instead he is correcting an abuse of power. And he's telling Timothy how to fix it. <clears throat> but even with all of these faithful questions and challenges, do we really need clarifications of ancient contexts to not just let women teach and serve in leadership roles, but to celebrate them? Do we really need explanations of what Paul meant in order to faithfully recognize that sexism and misogyny and the subjugation of women and girls are sin and that the Bible is meant for kingdom building and life giving, not for tearing people down and taking life away? Remember your hermeneutic. Remember the lens through which we read the Bible. Remember the word of Christ through which we are called to see one another. We have heard it said, I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. But Jesus, standing in a room full of men, points to a nameless woman with no place in this scene, a woman who is thought to be a sinner by Simon, the man hosting all the other men in his home. And Jesus says to him loud enough for every person in that room to hear, do you see this woman? Do you see the women of Jesus' ancestry and the women who informed his teachings, Eve and Rahab and Sarah, Shipra and Pua and Deborah the prophet, Rachel and Leah, Bilhah and Zilpah, Hagar and Tamar, Bathsheba and Dinah? Do you see the nameless women in the New Testament? and their life experiences that Jesus illuminates. The woman who touches the hem of his garment. The widow who puts two coins, all she has, into the temple treasury. The woman who pours expensive perfume on Jesus' head. The women who were his disciples. Do we see them? You have heard it said, let a woman learn in silence with full submission. But do you see Joyce Mitchell? the Sunday school teacher who taught me my first Bible verses and the Bible stories that I would commit to head and heart? Do you see Lisa Booker, the first and only woman I had as a coach who encouraged me and pushed me to the point that I finally reached my goals on the swim team when I was a senior in high school? Do you see the Reverend Don Darwin Weeks, a woman who got up on a stage at the Baptist youth camp where I attended, and preached so powerfully that I actually listened. And I thought, I want to do that. Do you see the Reverend Dr. Joe Gale Hudson, a former pastor of this church and the first woman friends church would have as its pastor, whose ministry shaped this body of Christ to be what it is right now? Do you see my mom, who stood up to her dad when she was a teenager and he was drinking too much? And she told him to cut it out and to quit being rude to her friends and to stop being who he wasn't so that he would become the kind grandparent that I loved so much. Impossible without them. God may be able to speak in spite of us, but we cannot hear what she's saying without listening to every one of us. Not just allowed and tolerated, but affirmed and celebrated. Jenna Daniels felt God calling her to seminary and to ministry when she was 19 years old. She was at North Park University in Chicago when she sensed Jesus saying to her, love my church, give what you have to my people. And she said yes to that call. When her dad came to pick her up for the eight-hour drive home for the summer, she was excited to tell him all about it. But he met her excitement with questions because of her gender. She was really sensing a call to ministry. She was a woman after all, and he had heard it said, 
What her dad said to her in that car wounded her. It was a long drive home. Over time, however, that dynamic changed. Now, Daniels says, my dad sees God at work in me. But when Daniels told her dad that she wanted to share her testimony about her calling to the ministry with her church and how her dad's feelings on it had changed, she learned in that conversation that he still had some confusion and discomfort about her being a pastor. Specifically, or suddenly, the wound from that long drive home was bleeding again. And then her dad said something that stuck with her. He said, Jen, the fundamentalism I grew up in runs deep. She realized that her dad was also wounded. Wounded from hurtful hermeneutics and life-taking interpretations of Scripture. And those wounds run deep. Beloved community, today we may be revisiting some wounds many of us, what draws us together in the Spirit's tether in this particular body of Christ are the wounds we bear. Many of us bear the wounds of weaponized Scripture. Anything from the subjugation of women to violence against LGBTQ plus people to the exclusion of people with differing abilities to warmongering against our neighbors of different faiths to various methods of shaming that keep us all in chains. The Bible may have been used to keep us down, to keep us from being who God dreams for us to be when we are meant to be free. But good people, the good news for us is that the story God has for our lives doesn't end with our wounds. The Christ we follow in the season of Lent takes us to a cross where he is wounded, but after all the hurt, After all the pain and the public shaming and the life taking he endured, Jesus was raised to new life. He was set free into abundant, everlasting life. And this is for all of us. Our wounds are not the end. Our wounds are an invitation, a calling to tell the truth. Because when the truth is known, we are set free free to be healed and to heal one another, free to be loved and to love one another, free to give witness to the one who sees you and loves you too much for you to ever sell yourself short. Thanks be to God. Amen. today's worship experience is connected with you, and you want to know more about being a part of this community of faith, we want you to know that the doors of Friends Church are open and welcome to all, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your journey of life. You are welcome to join your journey with ours in membership. We have an inquiry class coming up on March 28th at 12.30 p.m. on Zoom following the 11 a.m. online service, and a second session on April 11th at the same time. We'll be receiving new members into the life of Friends Church later this spring. If you have any questions about what it means to be a part of this community of faith, don't hesitate to reach out to Pastors Dan or Trent, and know that no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your journey, 
you are welcome here at Friends Church. We now want to welcome all of you that are joining us today to join us as we gather around this virtual table for communion. This table does not belong to this particular church or to the particular denomination. It is a table where all are welcome. And so I want to invite you at this time to go into your home and find something that will work for bread, either a piece of bread or a cracker, um, anything that you might have that might resemble bread in your home. And likewise, grab something that will work for juice, even if it's a simple cup of water, so that we can come together and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. All are welcome. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Take, eat, do so, remembering me. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Whenever you take and drink, do so remembering me. For when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the life and death of Jesus Christ until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. Please partake of the Lord's Supper together. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. The version that we will be reading today is by Chance Hunter. Let us pray. Breath of life in whom we live and move and have our being. Your presence fills all of creation. May justice and mercy reign in our lives and in our world. Today, may our bellies be full, our hearts warm, and our fellowship open. May we reconcile with people we've hurt, just as we reconcile with the people who've hurt us. Lead us not into a time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For wherever grace and community abide, there you are with us. We are not alone. Blessed be. Yeah. 
the love of Jesus, the grace of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, let us go out into the world and bless one another and lead our lives in such a way that those who know us but may not know God might come to know God because they know us. Amen and amen.